Where are you at with Winds of Winter? How's it coming? Working on it! I think that you, you probably won't say it again. I bet I do. Okay. Working on it! Hi everybody! So we are here with another Fire and Blood video. His new book. And this is the second video about Aegon the Conqueror and how we should read critically everything that is written about him. In the previous video I explained how his portrayal is fake news and propaganda. Link is in the description. And now I want to talk about how every word that is written about his allies and enemies seems to me sending a message to the lords of Westeros about how they should and should not act in the future. It's a message that is crafted very carefully to cover all the bases. So this history of the Targaryens is not written as a novel, but instead it mimics how medieval history was often written. And that history wasn't meant to educate and inform people about what happened. No, no, no. It was there to send the message in the name of the ruler. It was the history on behalf of the ruler. Let him know more will step to any motherfucker, Omar, Barksdale, whoever. My name is my name. So in this case, Aegon is a conqueror. Conquerors need to quickly establish their new rule. They have to make their subjects understand what are the boundaries, lest they themselves, the Targaryens, will be cast aside in the Game of Thrones. And in this Game of Thrones story, it is abundantly clear <laughs> that it is from a very particular point of view, the Targaryens' point of view. So first of all, pledge, and then don't rebel, stay loyal. So Aegon's conquest in Fine Blood is written as a cautionary tale. Look what happened to my enemies. Hmm? to the people who rebelled. So how do you get to be the king? It ain't like that. See, the king, stay the king, all right? Everything stay who he is. And on the other hand, ah, look how well those who supported me are doing. Mm. You have such a beautiful castle, such a beautiful castle. It would be a shame if something happened to it. I heard there are big dragons lurking around, and who knows if they might burn you alive. You know, that would be such a terrible shame, terrible shame. Speaking of shame, there is one message running throughout the story. It's not a shame to lose to dragons and to bow to one. No, the swords of the fallen are respected. So after they lost, their swords were made part of the Iron Throne. Yeah, 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 there's an obvious threat there. But when Aegon throws into the river the swords of those who did not bow, it says to the Lord, that did cower after they lost, that melting their swords into a throne. No, no, it's not an affront. It's an honor. It's an honor, come on. Every power in real history is always using history in order to advance an agenda. For example, let's take American politics. If you want to lower taxes, you point to certain aspects of American history, the free entre entrepreneurship and such. If you want to raise taxes, so you point to other, <laughs> other times in history, FDR and others who raised taxes. See what I'm talking about? Okay, so let's go through some of the main characters in this conquest and show how they are described and what that tells us. Let's start with Heron the Black, who blatantly defied the would-be king. Hey, yo, lesson here, babe. You come at the king? You best not miss. Heron is described as a tyrant from the foreign Iron Islands. A person who did not understand the power of the dragons. No, no, no. He talked smack. And then Aegon was like, when the sun sets, your line shall end. Boom, he called it confirmed. Uh, Heron had a chance. <laughs> and he blew it. And the price was absolute genocide on the herons because Aegon descended on top of a dragon inside Heron's castle and bathed them in black fire. That battle became legend and this legend is a valuable lesson for all the lords to come. If mighty Heron Hall was burned so easily, hiding in your castle 
will not save you against the wrath of the dragon spawn. Mm, then there are the Lannisters and Gardeners, kings of the rock and of the rich, respectively. Lauren Lannister, he quickly adapted and bent the knee after King Mern burned. So Lauren Lannister, he played the Game of Thrones well and got rewarded. All in the game, yo. <laughs> All in the game. That happened after the Field of Fire. This is the most famous battle of Aegon's conquest. And it is said to have been a victory against the mightiest host ever seen in Westeros. An army of 55,000 strong. Roaring and screaming, urged on by horns and drums. How did that work out for you, huh? Hey! So we know the story, they had five times more men than Aegon, and Aegon's men were new recruits. So he and his sisters hopped on the dragons and burned them, burned them all. It's the only time the three dragons were dispatched to battle at the same time, so there's a mythological feel about it. Hmm? Don't wake the dragons, this is like only in the extreme case scenario, because that's the last resort. But when all three are deployed, well, it doesn't matter how strong you are, because the bigger they are, they <laughs> the quicker they burn. Mm. And it is emphasized, there were only 100 Targaryen losses compared to thousands upon thousands on the other side. So don't try him in open battle. Hmm? And Aegon, he's not just a dragon rider. He's a formidable war general, beware. And the gods are on his side. Hmm? There had been no rain for more than a fortnight in an area near King's Landing, so that's an omen. And that's where he chose to have the battle. Hmm? The grass was really dry and ready to burn quickly, so, you know, it's not just because he has dragons that is good, right? And when the Lannisters switched sides, Aegon was, true to his promises, lifted the beaten foe back to his feet and confirmed his lands and lordship. Listen here, be smart about it. Don't burn for nothing. Hmm? There's more rewards if you bend the knee. You can either burn or keep what you have. Just have to pay little taxes for some dragons. That's it. Hmm? And the Tyrells in the rich, they were rewarded for their loyalty in place of the burned gardeners. But when you bump a house up the ladder, you need to explain to the other lords why it's the Tyrells <laughs> who get that bump and not them. So there's an emphasis on the historical connection between the Tyrells and Highgarden because you want to build up your strategic allies. Okay, let's go to the north. Ooh, they're a different bunch, those guys. I mean, it's a whole different breed. The northerners have always been different from the rest of the Seven Kingdoms with their weird religion and ancestry. So they're called savages, which indicates pretty clearly that they didn't really have a part in writing this story. Hmm? And when they head into battle, it is emphasized that everyone joins Aegon's side. All had come to fight these barbarians. Because for Westeros, the Northerners are more others than the dragon-riding Valyrians. And we know that the Starks did not end up fighting. Torren gave up his crown of King of the North. But his Northern lords and knights, ooh, they wanted to fight, but King Torren didn't. And thus he became... For the northerners, the king who knelt, because they're proud. But that's in northern lore. In this history, he made the right political decision. This history looks kindly on it, and it also sends a message. Even when your surrounding is ready to die, don't do it, man. He tamed his savages, his war hawks. Okay, okay, what about Edmund Tully, a lord of the Riverlands, who made a wise business decision by being the first to rebel against Harren the Black and join Aegon's side. Must have done something to you. Nah, no, it's just business. Lord Edmund's rebellion against his king, Harren, inspired others to rise up against him too. That was very important in usurping the king of the Riverlands and replacing him with Aegon as the one true king of the Seven Kingdoms. 
So when the tallies were awarded the Riverlands, the message here, the first to pledge got to grow his brand. Hmm? Lord Paramount of the Trident, come on, that's nice. It's very nice. Oh, oh, Oris Baratheon, that's a fascinating character that I did not know before. Hmm? He's a bastard, but he played his cards well and got all the way up. All right, these right here, these are the pawns. They like the soldiers. Now for pawn, made it all the way down to the other dude's side, you get to be queen. Pawns, man, in the game, they get capped quick. They be out the game early, unless they some smart ass pawns. You got to be hand of the king. With regards to lordship positions in the land, Aegon promoted only highborn lords. But the hand of the king, that's a political appointment, right? Oris was his dear, dear friend. So that could point to nepotism mm, and not to a meritocracy. So, so Oris, no, he wasn't just his friend. No, he, uh, ah, ah, okay, okay. He was such a great warrior that he killed the super tough Argilac in a man-to-man -man battle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's how we went down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What a coincidence that Oris got to meet uh, Argy like face to face you know, during the battle. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so we'll never know <laughs> if that's truth or myth. But this was a time in history when no one really recorded what the foot soldiers said, and this is a Lord's game. Mm. So in this story, Oris won in a legendary battle. So listen up, bastards. He then got to marry Argilic's wife and he entered into the aristocratic club. He was gentle about it, for sure, so even though he's a bastard, he's a nice bastard. Mm? And his heirs then became high lords. So vote Aegon, vote Aegon. And then there were the Aryans, they had a plan. Mm? They wanted to stay behind their gate in the Eyrie because no one can go through that, right? That's the way they wanted it to go. You want it to be one way. What? But it's the other way. But Aegon's sister, Visenya, dropped down in the yard <laughs> of their castle in a super badass move. And before they all could say Seven Kingdoms, she was there playing with the new Aaron baby next to her dragon without saying a damn word. And as his mom, the Lady of the Eyrie, and all the knights stormed out to the yard, ooh, man, picture it. It's a powerful scene. You can taste the terror with this dragon queen holding a little baby next to her vicious monster. Ugh, that's a frightening look. So to relieve the pressure, the history teller quickly tries to take, quickly takes away the fear so we would not hate the Targaryens because the baby loved the dragon. Yeah, and all was well, yes. Ha 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 ha. That wasn't scary at all. No, no. Let's be friends. <laughs> But the Arendt is such an old house, very respected. So it's explicitly mentioned that the Arendt were fighting with bastards, tripled the size of the garrisons in stone, snow, and sky. While Aegon, he was fighting with the trueborn lords. So the Arendt were not the moral ones in this fight because a foreign lord is better than a local bastard, you know what I'm saying? And when Aegon was clearly winning, there were still some lords who would not yield. So the way that their story is told is that their men usurped them and bowed to the dragons in their name. So, Mr. Lord, don't think you can fight Aegon to the death. Hmm? Your own people might kill you before the fight even starts. Okay, okay, Dorn, Dorn, Dorn. Oof, they play a whole different game. I got the shotgun. We got the briefcase. It's on the game though, right? They're Dornish, they're different. They don't fight fair, lord against lord, army against army, nah, they're cowards. That's why we didn't beat them. Nah. It's because they cheated, no, and it was, it's very sunny in Dorne, so the sun was in my eyes, come on. They kept running away before the Targaryens got there. They would not fight, they burned some of their own castles so as not to leave anything for the Targaryens to conquer. And their people in Dorne, they were all in on it, mm. covering for them leaving behind in cities and castles just women, children, and older men. What's up with that? So in this case, you know, the martyrs that aren't the princes of Dorne, the, the princes of the Dornish, like the Scots and others who burned castles and did scorched earth policy to fend off invaders. The princess, the yellow toad of Dorne, 
She's both ridiculed so as not to make her sound too great, but it must be explained how she didn't lose to the dragons, which is tantamount to a big win. So they do have to show her some mysterious respect. And how did the war end? Hmm? And how did we get out from this conundrum where Aegon cannot conquer Dorne? Ah, okay, a very, very nice excuse. She sent Aegon a mysterious letter and no one else got to read it by Aegon himself. And after he read this mysterious letter, he decided to stop the war and agree to terms. Seems to me like a very convenient way to allow Aegon to explain away his loss. No, he did not know what was in the letter. So now people can just imagine the worst, <laughs> the worst and the most sinister thing possible. So Aegon didn't take the L, no, he remains unbeaten. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, sure. Mm. Okay, if you enjoyed the video, hit like. So the next videos will be about Maegor and Anis. I think there's a lot of Machiavelli about them. And then Jaharis, who I have all kinds of thoughts about how to tackle this one. So subscribe to get those upcoming Fire and Bell videos. If you're also interested in more contemporary politics, I just posted on Patreon as part of the exclusive content for our patrons a new video about the rise of global authoritarianism. It's something that you've probably noticed <laughs> that is happening around the world. So this is a conversation with an interesting researcher. I think it sheds some interesting light on that. So check out our Patreon page if you're into those kind of videos. It's on patreon.com slash God Academy. I want to thank our patrons for supporting our channel. So thank you everybody for watching. I'll see you all next time. Bye everybody. Girl, you can't even call this shit a war. Why not? Wars end.